Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Houston Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center Grand Rounds. Um, before we get started today, I just want to do a little housekeeping items. We are broadcasting live via live stream and YouTube, so please use your microphone to ask questions. The recording is always available for viewing, and consider uh, subscribing to our YouTube channel to get notifications when videos are added. For our viewers, if you'd like to submit a question, text DeBakey to 37607. Again, DeBakey to 37607. You also may submit questions via our live stream feed. Find the video or live stream on livestream.com backslash HMH hyphen edu. Um, do want to bring to your attention that we have three more conferences scheduled uh, for 2023. Um, on October the 18th through the 20th is our multimodality imaging for the clinician. On October 26th and 27th is our open aortic training. And our transdoppler imaging and vascular ultrasound masterclass will be December the 2nd. So as we move forward today in our grand rounds, it's my great privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Ray Hirschberger, who I consider not only a friend, but someone who I aspire uh, to model my career after um, as a great mentor and leader in our field. He's currently the professor of medicine and director of human genetics in the Department of Internal Medicine, Ohio State University. Um, he's previously led heart transplant programs at both Oregon Health Sciences Center and uh, University of Miami. One of the things that I just want to point out about Dr. Hirschberger, in addition to being a leader in our field of cardiovascular genetics and publishing over 140 um, articles, and a lot of them really guideline statements that have really led uh, not only our, our treatment for these patients, but have also been incredibly thought-provoking and I think have, have really um, challenged me uh, to be able to look deeper into this uh, condition. But I think something that I really found fascinating that I learned just last night at dinner is Dr. Hirschberger actually became interested in cardiovascular genetics with reading an article in the New England Journal of Medicine when he was doing his training. And I think that this is a, his career is a testament to what just interest and passion can lead people to do. And so I think that's another thing that, you know, in addition to obviously uh, following and learning from all of this great information, I think modeling that career, following one's passion, I think we have an amazing example of how that's led to completely wonderful things. So I'm very excited um, to uh, hear Dr. Hirschberger speak to us today on lessons from the DCM Precision Medicine Study, We Can Prevent Heart Failure. Dr. Hirschberger. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Cindy. Um, that's a very kind introduction. And yes, I, at the University of Miami, I did direct the, the um, cardiology uh, fellowship training program. And <clears throat> and um, that's one thing I always uh, stressed was read to the fellows. Read, 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 and it's still very important today, even though we tend to be visual and it's all, you know, YouTube, um, um, <clears throat> Twitter and all of that stuff. Uh, it's still important. Pick up the literature and read it. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, and uh, I am a heart failure transplant cardiologist. Uh, I have the privilege of, of directing human genetics at OSU. I have no relevant clinical uh, uh, <clears throat> disclosures. This is what we study. That's the cartoon of the normal left ventricle. And with myocyte injury, it can be a lot of different things. You get this dilated left ventricle with contractile dysfunction. But before I launch into the science of this, let me tell you a story. This is a true story. This is David Newell, and I have permission from the family to discuss David in his case. He underwent heart transplant at the Oregon Health and Science University in 1993. Yes, I was just, just in my first real job at OHSU. Uh, and um, <clears throat> one Monday after clinic, I got a call from the pediatric cardiologist who had just picked up the service on a Monday David had been in the intensive care unit for two weeks on dibutamine. And uh, she was concerned because he was not doing well and said uh, can, uh, she wanted to bring him to transplant listing conference on Wednesday. I said, let's take a look at him, sent a fellow up, <clears throat> met David at 4 o'clock that Monday afternoon. He was gray, ash, and pale, had a blood pressure of systolic at best 58 and was clearly acidotic, clearly dying, and been on inotropes for two weeks. And uh, <clears throat> I actually uh, loaded in 
norinone, high dose, switched to epi to preserve blood pressure. Found the family, said he's dying, and got the coordinators to get an ABO. We crashed, listed him for transplant within four hours. <clears throat> and he was, on this picture, this is Kathy Crispell, who's fairly short, and the thoracic fellow who did his heart transplant, fairly short too. He was a little kid. We didn't have a balloon pump small enough for him. Of course, there were no VADs. It was, it was medical therapy, which I knew how to do, thank goodness. But, um, and we were very lucky, got a donor within 48 hours, got him transplanted. This is now a few weeks later. The GAN cyclovir is running. Uh, he was high risk CMV, and, and it's a happy story. Wonderful success. Fast forward to 1995, you get a call from the University of Minnesota, and um, the question was, what did Davis Heart show? And I said, the usual, nothing much. I mean, a little hypertrophy, but that was it. <clears throat> Why? And the, and the answer was because his first cousin had sudden cardiac death and was being evaluated for heart transplant at the University of Minnesota. Well, we had started, I read the New England Journal article in January, the January 20, 1992 version. And it was about a, it was a family-based study, clinical study of taking fam, first probands with dilated cardiomyopathy, looking at their family members, and it turned out in that study, 20% of probands had family members with DCM. I'd never seen that before, even though I trained at the University of Utah, had a fantastic training event. Um, we were doing 70, 80 transplants a year, um, <clears throat> and um, I'd never seen familial cardiomyopathy, so we'd started this program to identify and characterize genetic causes of DCM to translate that new knowledge into cardiovascular medicine. So we called in the family, mom and dad, two older brothers, <clears throat> and lo and behold, his father had been treated with benzodiazepines for about eight months because of panic attacks at night. But of course, what he actually had was symptomatic heart failure that was not recognized, had neck veins elevated, EF of 25% and edema and, and uh, all of the other findings. And <clears throat> we um, diagnosed heart failure and idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy in the father through research screening. The problem was the first cousin who had sudden cardiac death was on mom's side of the family. So <clears throat> this is the pedigree that we published a few years later in Jack in 1999. This black arrow here shows David. The dad was the, he had heart failure and dilated cardiomyopathy. The two older brothers, and I will show you this at the, later on in, the, in, the, in this talk, uh, the rest of the story, we would, I, would not, I would not make the two older brothers black as affected, but they had some very early evidence of DCM, and this was 1990, uh, 1995. We, I would not do it exactly the same way today. The first cousin was over here, had sudden cardiac death, and, um, and yet his father had, had DCM, and so the question was or what we observed was unexpected complexity. Now, I was an assistant professor. What did I know? I just started this program about cardiovascular genetics, and I figured it was a one-off. Once in my career, see something funny. I show you this pedigree, I've been showing this pedigree for years because it is representative of DCM genetics. So it presented a simplex disease in one person but was really familial. There was bilineal inheritance, how common is that? What's the genetic model? The conventional would be autosomal dominant, incomplete penetrance, variable expressivity, variable age of onset. In this case, it looked like disease from both mom and dad, so the proverbial double hit um, and <clears throat> this multiple alleles or rare variants or mutations contributing to an oligogenic, few genes or, or a, a multigenic model or other models of rare and common variants that would be, uh, or something else including environmental impact. So what we study is dilated cardiomyopathy. We think that's at least half ref, at least half of the US heart failure cases. We define it as LVE and an EF less than 0.5. Of course, we sort ischemic from non-ischemic and other causes are relatively straightforward to exclude. And then what's left we consider to be IDC and we think that's well over a million cases and that's what we study. We do know based upon the historical literature that, that some of that, it's ranged uh, in a frequency, is familial. 
And if it's truly familial, most of us would say, yes, it's genetic, and that's been recognized for a long time. But of course, most of what walks into the clinic, even if you screen family members, appears to be non-familial, and the cause of that has been debated for years, viruses or other kinds of things. Um, and so we've been studying both familial, non-familial, really, for a long time. Now, this is what we study, and this is why we study it. <clears throat> and again, I'm a transplant cardiologist. I know drugs, devices, mechanical support transplant. It's wonderful, it save, saves lives, but it's enormous impact on patients and families, and of course, costs, costs, has enormous cost implications. It does not start with heart failure, it starts with dilated cardiomyopathy. Months or years, this blue line is a causal pathway. And of course, at least in adults, we think that in most cases, we have family-based data to support this, of course, that the normal heart turns into DCM over time, and the critical point which we forget because we work in acute care hospitals, is that this is all asymptomatic until it finally presents, we think, you know, 80, 85% of the time with heart failure, uh, but also can present with arrhythmia and of course occasionally an embolus, um, you know, mural thrombus that goes somewhere and causes trouble. The asymptomatic part is, and so when it finally presents, it's late phase disease. Now there is clinical disease there in the family members if you would screen them, and there's risk of disease, and of course risk of disease genetics is about one thing, risk. And so genetic information will pre permit risk assessment so you can do surveillance screening, periodic echoes, if you know that somebody is at risk, so you can detect very early DCM and ideally prevent it. We just sent out a grant, let's see, I guess one week ago today, to look at a study I will tell you about, to look forward, and it's really about de defining the earliest evidence of DCM before they actually ha meet formal criteria. There's also clinical screening. When you screen family members, it's amazing what you find when you look for it. And the idea is if you find DCM, you want to prevent the advanced disease with the idea that dialing in early therapy will actually make a big difference. We don't have formal evidence of that, at least certainly within the genetic uh, in the genetic area, uh, informed by genetics, but, but that's an experiment that needs to be done. And of course, I'm a transplant cardiologist, but I sort of shifted the focus from saving lives, you know, by doing transplant and all of that, to trying to prevent disease, thereby saving lives, so it's really a shift in, in focus. That being said, transplant's gonna be around forever, no question about it. People are always gonna present with late phase disease. But all of us, including all of you in the room who see any of these patients, can prevent disease. So for heritable disease, the family is the unit of study, the unit of interest. A proband is an individual who brings a family to medical attention. Most of us have been trained to only consider the patient in front of us, so we need to change our view from the, the patient, uh, the person as a patient, to the proband as the entree to the family who can identify the address relatives. So the difference in these terms, of course, a patient focused on the individual, the proband defines the individual as a member of the family at risk. Of course, you can show that family as a pedigree, it's extremely valuable, you should do it uh, when you have a new diagnosis of DCM. And of course, it's a transition from a patient-only focus to really understanding this as uh, the patient as a proband, the entree to the family. Now, familial DCM prevalence, who cares? Why is this uh, important? Provides insight into the heritable nature of DCM and we can estimate DCM familial risk independent of genetics. We can also derive age-specific disease risks independent of genetics and of course family-based care can dr directly contribute to the prevention of DCM and heart failure. This is a, a really nice um, <clears throat> meta-analysis of 23 studies looking at the frequency, the estimates of familial DCM, and they've ranged from two to 65% with high heterogeneity, and, um, <clears throat> uh, but the, the number that they came up with was 23%. Other issues is that most, essentially all of these, were only in white families. Black patients with DCM and heart failure have more hospitalization and death. It's been attributed to uh, adverse social determinants of health and hypertension and other things. The other fact is, is that diversity in genetic studies really enhances discovery. And I don't have the time to share you the data, but it's, there's no question about that. So to address these questions, uh, the DCM precision medicine study was developed with a central hypothesis that DCM, whether familial or non-familial, had substantial genetic basis. 
It was a family-based study where we found patients, probands, and their first-degree relatives were enrolled. Um, we had 25 U.S. clinical sites geographically dispersed. OSU served as the coordinating center and clinical site. We aimed to enroll half black and half white patients. We started uh, enrollment in June of 2016, finished a uh, closed enrollment April of 2021. We had support from the NHLBI and a supplement from the Genome Institute. These are the 25 DCM consortium clinical sites. These were uh, wonderful, um, really solid heart failure transplant programs. And yes, there's Houston Methodist. You are on the map. I don't have to tell you guys that. Uh, and um, Cindy Martin, who is here, invited me to talk, and Barry Trachtenberg, who's sitting back here. Uh, Barry was the site PI during the study, and Barry's uh, switched, and now Cindy's the, uh, the site PI, and we're pleased to have both uh, Barry and Cindy and Houston Methodist as a part of this uh, consortium. The specific hypotheses are shown here. The first, 35% of IDC is familial. The second, similar proportions of familial, non-familial have genetic cause. Third, similar proportions of DCM of European or African ancestry have identifiable genetic cause. And then the fourth was a tailored intervention to help DCM probands communicate DCM risk. It's a communication aim. Uh, will improve the uptake and impact of, the, of their activities to assess that risk. So the first was uh, published last year, the first hypothesis was published last year, the, the hypothesis three was published just about uh, two months ago, and then uh, the fourth was uh, published in circulation a little bit earlier today. I'm going to present those three today, and the, uh, the hypothesis two, we're still working on that manuscript. So. <clears throat> There were two publication aims. The first was to estimate the prevalence of familial DCM among DCM probands. And of course, in this diagram here, the, this black blackened person, this is a female, of course, the circle um, with the arrow is the proband, and <clears throat> shown here. And then the second was to estimate the age-specific cumulative risk of DCM in the first degree relatives First of your relatives are shown here in the green, of course, these are parents, siblings, or children. So really two aims, probands and FDRs. And then also, also estimate those across uh, race and ethnicity. So the definitions, um, we define, of course, LVF, as I showed in the pr prior slide, um, both left ventricular enlargement and uh, an EF less than 0.5. And then we excluded other, um, other um, clinically detectable causes, we were fussy about that. And we had great clinicians in the study. We also have a CMR, I should have put that uh, reference on the slide. We actually did a CMR, anal uh, analyzed the CMR data available, not from within the study, but the CMR data that had been available from about a third of the probands, which really validated we were squeaky clean. The familial DCM we defined as IDC in one or more first degree relatives. Probands who had no enrolled FDRs were considered as non-familial, so that's an inherent issue with doing a family-based study. We used an expanded DCM phenotype in the FDRs. LVE only, LVF less than 0.5 only, or DCM, all without known cause. Now this, we call this a partial phenotype. LV only or LV systolic dysfunction only, but not both require, required for our DCM definition. And then we used this expanded phenotype for an expanded familial DCM, and that was expanded phenotype in one or more first degree relatives. Finally, and importantly, we used a model-based analysis. Now, if you want to know what that is, there's about six pages in the supplement of this paper of fancy equations from the statistical geneticist Dan Kinneman who did this. It's basically the question, we only recruited, there were over 5,000 first-degree relatives that could have been enrolled. We only got 31% of those first-degree relatives to come into the study, the, and I'll come back to that. Uh, and so the model-based analysis were, were estimates as if all first-degree relatives had undergone clinical screening. So we had uh, 602 white patients, 516 black patients, 102 Hispanic patients. The Hispanic patients were the Genome Institute supplement to add Hispanics, which we appreciated very much. The family members, first-degree family members, 1693, 159 Hispanic, 492 black, and uh, over 1,000 white. These are the... Um, the uh, demographics, the age of the probands, about 52 years of age at enrollment, but ranging in age from 16 to 85. 
44% uh, females, we also wanted half females, very important. 57% white, 43% black, 8% Hispanic. The relatives, of course, uh, were younger, about 43 years of age, but again, ranging from an infant at 0.4 years up to 94 years of age, 60% uh, female, 70% white, 30% black, 9% Hispanic. These are the clinical cardiovascular data and the probands, the 1,220 probands at EF, average of 23%, but ranging from 4 to 50. We wanted a very broadly based representation of what DCM is across the spectrum. Not all sick, not all well, but the whole gambit, and we had a very broad range. The Z-score, uh, the standard deviation of the left ventricular and diastolic dimension, 4.3. Uh, clinical features, of course, everybody had to meet DCM criteria. 67% had an ICD, 21% had VADs, so a fairly sick group, and 15% had had previous heart transplant. The first degree relatives here, uh, the age, uh, the LVF, of course, was within normal, but ranged from 10 to 83%. Z-score was essentially normal, but again, a broad range. Uh, we had 9% that met a DCM criteria, 4% with ICDs, and 1% each with VAD and transplant. So in the probands, the crude and model-based estimates of familial DCM was 11.6% overall. That's just taking the simple math and just looking at it. The estimated prevalence was 29.7% overall with highly significant confidence intervals. The estimated prevalence of familial DCM by race, 39.4% in black, 28% in white, with no difference in Hispanic and non-Hispanic. Now the crude prevalence of an expanded definition, this is with this LVE, LV systolic dysfunction only, was 24.1% overall and the estimated prevalence of an expanded definition of familial DCM, 56.9% overall, with no difference between black and white probands. So, now this is again the proband data. This is the FDR data. So what is the risk to a first degree relative of dilated cardiomyopathy if they're a family member has DCM? And this is 19% overall risk by age 80. 33% risk with an expanded definition, that would be LV or LV systolic dysfunction only by 80 years of age. And the hazard ratio in black FDRs was 1.89 that of, of, of whites. This is, the, um, this is from the paper. This is the, um, the risk of DCM only or the expanded um, definition shown over age. And so you can see it comes up to about 19% for DCM for a first degree relative of a patient with uh, has DCM, or the partial phenotype upwards of 34%. This is the risk in first degree relatives by proband race and ethnicity. And of course, this line, this non-Hispanic black, is by far the highest, non-Hispanic white the lowest. And this is approaching 28%, and this is about 16%. And then importantly, which I haven't mentioned, this is the risk in first degree relatives by quartiles of proband age at DCM diagnosis. And the key point here is that a younger proband at DCM diagnosis confers increased risk to the family members. That's shown in this orange line here. These, in this case, it was um, proband uh, uh, age quartiles. The, the lowest quartile, less than 34 years of age, had a far greater risk than this gray line here, which is uh, probands that were uh, over 54 years of age shown here. Let me sum this up for you. The estimated prevalence of familial DCM is substantial. There's no question about that, and this is new data, and we use some fancy modeling and stuff to really what we get to what we think is a more realistic number of the risk in family members. Nearly 30% overall, 40% of black patients, nearly 60% when you include this partial phenotype, similar between white and black. In first degree relatives, the risk is also substantial, about one in five, and about one in three with an expanded definition. And the risk was higher for non-Hispanic black FDRs, 1.89. So the key messages, at least of this part of the talk, is that female DCM is prevalent, it's increased in black patients. The younger the proband, the greater the risk to FDRs. And it certainly supports the guidelines, which I do, I'm not, this is not a guideline-based talk, that's something different, but 
You need to take a family history. Clinical screening of the proband's first year relatives is indicated to assess their risk. And then counseling of at-risk relatives is indicated and genetic testing for those where you indicated in first year relatives if you have a finding in the proband. So the next question is, what about the family members who are newly discovered with evidence of DCM screening? We published a paper in Jack a few months ago, uh, and it really was, the question is, how much asymptomatic DCM is really present? And this is the, the proband, uh, this is the inclusion uh, data, 735 probands who had one or more eligible first degree relatives, some had no qualifying FDRs, and then some uh, fell out for other reasons. And then of those, there were 16, uh, over 1,600 first degree relatives, but 248 had prior known DCM or DCM partial phenotypes, which left 1,365, and those were the ones that had no known evidence of anything when they came in the study. So the findings of those FDRs, 80, almost 86% screen negative. 12% had a newly diagnosed partial DCM phenotype, and 2.1 had newly diagnosed DCM by clinical screening. Now those 14%, of course, uh, that's sort of the, the take home message here. The 86% the who screen negative, we would recommend continue to periodic, periodic screening of them every two or three years in ECHO to, make to see, identify earliest disease. Of course, the ones who have new DCM, we start guideline-directed medical therapy. This group up here, this newly diagnosed partial DCM phenotype, um, the guidelines have not dealt with this. We really have no data, and of course, if somebody has an EF, a low EF but is not dilated, I think we would all start a beta blocker ACE inhibitor or do something. The LVE, we have really very, we have no, uh, to my knowledge, no insight into is what we should do with them, at least that's from a rigorous study. So the bottom line, you can find actual DCM or early evidence when you screen families. We surmise you can prevent DCM and thereby prevent heart failure. So you can do this. Uh, the cohort was rider, widely representative. I think that's really important. This is not a one-off. Yes, it was at transplant centers, but we really got a very broad range of patients. Um, and then the final comment is, it's always surprising what you find when you look for it. And of course, we only find what we look for. We all know that, so. Okay, moving on to hypothesis three. This is um, the genetics. So I'm gonna go through each of these genes in exquisite detail. I won't, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but um, you can see that the DCM gene ontology is extensive, much broader than HCM or ARVC, and I won't go through that today in the interest of time. This is a diagram that we published now over 10 years ago, but it's been updated, and I have the privilege of writing the Brownwald chapter and, and dilated cardiomyopathy, and this has been updated. Uh, DCM is the solid lines represent genes that have some evidence of uh, association with DCM, and then hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dotted lines, and channelopathies, SCN5A here, and then ARVC over here, and you can see that there's a lot of overlap of the genes with these different phenotypes. The strength of evidence for each of these genes varies greatly though, and so the clinical genome resource or ClinGen, uh, DCM gene curation, we completed a couple years ago and published that. The website here is extremely helpful if you want to drill down on any specific gene and find the evidence in association not only with DCM with any of the other cardiovascular phenotypes. It's really a wonderful resource. The blue bars show clinical evidence, the orange bars laboratory evidence of the carefully curated study. There were 12 definitive and strong evidence genes uh, and seven moderate evidence genes, and those 19 we consider the most relevant genes for clinical genetic testing. And then these other limited genes, a long list of them, these are genes of uncertain significance, and they are uh, able only unusually uh, to render a variant classified as pathogenic or likely pathogenic and that's important because only path or likely path variants are, cons are recommended for predictive testing at of at-risk family members. Predictive testing is this term within the genetics universe, as you probably know, of being able to use a variant to decide if a family member does not have the family variant. If it's a VOS, you don't know what it is, so you cannot use it to exclude a family member from ongoing clinical screening. So it's a critically important thing of assessing risk in the family members, uh, even though 
the d genetic determinations in the proband, of course. This is a cartoon or a, a diagram of, of the genetics, and it shows the overlap here. Again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, DCM only, long QT brigada with SCN5A, ARVC overlap with these genes along with the uh, gene ontology. So the genetics, we did exome sequencing. We analyzed 36 genes, including those 19 ClinGen high moderate evidence genes. We were very careful and fussy about clinical variant adjudication. We used the ClinGen and the ACMG approach for DCM and published methods. And then we also had an impaneled an external expert uh, group uh, that reviewed and approved our variant curation approach because it's important that we are rigorous and thoughtful and up to date. So there were differences w observed. Again, it's amazing what you find when you look for it, and no one had really looked, had the data to really carefully look at this in a rigorous way. Now the background for this slide and the next three or four slides are kind of the same format. Titan truncating variants, TTN, TVS, are the most prevalent gene phenotype association for DCM that usually ranges in the 15 to 20 percent range depending upon what cohort you're looking at. So the first panel here are the variants in genes by this ClinGen classification, Titan, and then the non-Titan definitive and strong evidence genes that I showed you before, moderate evidence and other. And then down here at the bottom is the, is the ancestry by African shown in these bars, European in these bars, Native American. I will not discuss Native American because the numbers are small and I don't have time to go through all of it. Um, and then on the vertical axis, there was the proportion of variants shown. And that's the next three or four slides will be in the same format. Now what we observed were fewer Titan truncating variants in African ancestry. And it was not subtle. It was like big time. There had been one previous suggestion of this in a report that didn't have enough numbers to really get to statistical significance. But not quite half of African ancestry had fewer Titan truncating variants compared to, to European ancestry. Also then, there were fewer variants in the non-Titan definitive strong evidence DCM genes. Nevertheless, there was a highly significant association of Titan truncating variants with DCM, so clearly Titan is highly relevant if you find it in an African ancestry patient. There's fewer numbers of those uh, truncating variants found. The second slide here, the background is a predicted loss of function. PLOF variant is easier to get to a PLP adjudication according to the ACMG guidelines. Missense is just harder to do. So a missense variant, just a simple amino acid change that changes an amino acid but doesn't, doesn't truncate the protein, is harder. And the predicted impact is shown here again in African ancestry, fewer uh, PLOF variants in Titan and in all other genes with uh, predicted loss of function, shown here in the second gray bar. Uh, in African versus European ancestry, and then more missense variants in African ancestry. The background, of course, I've already mentioned, path likely path variant is actionable, and a VOS is no man's land. You can't really use that. So these are classified as path likely path VOS. Of course, very few. They're supposed to be. This black bar is pathogenic, shown here. In European, a, a small frequency, and then mostly likely path here. There's a tiny little trivial bar in path, and then mostly likely path, but really much less. But of course, interestingly, far more VOSs in African ancestry. Now, putting some of this together, there is known to be greater diversity and more missense variants that have been observed in the underlying or general genetic architecture of African ancestry relative to European ancestry. And I, I provide here um, a reference from the American Journal of Human Genetics. There are several references. I picked one that would, if you want to look at one or want to drill down on this. This gets into complex population-based genetics. Remember, I'm just a cardiologist. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's complicated, but, but this is reflecting now more underlying genetic realities. Um, and so um, this is uh, what we found was fewer African ancestry variants absent or rare in NOMAD. Uh, NOMAD is a large genomic database. And uh, when you look at this absent or rare NOMAD, it's just uh, fewer in African ancestry. And then 
uh, fewer African ancestry variants than other relevant ACM gene gene classifications, and again, that probably is, has some to do with, with the background. So let me just summarize this. Uh, the conclusion is that DCM genetic architecture differs. It differs between patients of African ancestry and European ancestry. There are fewer actionable variants and more VUSs, as shown, um, <clears throat> and fewer truncating variants, more missense variants. The Titan, I show the Titan there. And then less data from African ancestry, uh, importantly, less data from African ancestry patients available in our clinical databases. The reason for that is almost all the sequencing that has been done has been done in white patients, European ancestry. So we need that database data to elevate a VUS to path or likely path. We don't have those data. And again, the paper goes through all, all of that uh, if you want to drill down on that. So the bottom line is inferences based upon current DCM genetic data, almost all from European ancestry is incomplete. It's not wrong, it's just incomplete. And may be misleading for patients of African ancestry. We get VUSs and you say, gee, is a VUS, we don't know what's going on, do they even have genetics? Yes, they have genetics, we just haven't been able to get that VUS elevated. Key point. Okay, so let me go to the, this hypothesis four. This is, so what's the key challenge to getting clinical screening of family members done? It's getting the family members to engage. I mean, and it's, this is the, um, the, the plate of the, the publication, Family Heart Talk, to improve family member screening in DCM. So what's Family Heart Talk? This is just a couple of excerpts from this booklet. It was a booklet that we gave it talked about family history and how DCM is inherited with some nice pictures and um, <clears throat> how many have DCM, some population genetic stuff, and what about symptoms and, and knowing if family members have DCM and what should my family and I do with some pedigrees and different descriptions of how it presents. And then talk to your family members about familial DCM. This was, you know, we had, um, you know, patients, both black and white, and men and women, look at this and, and validate it and all of that before we used it. So the study was very simple. We enrolled probands, and at enrollment, a proband was randomized one to one to receive family heart talk, stratified by sight and race. And then we recruited, we asked the probands to help recruit their family members because we cannot call the family members cold. We have to have get the information from the proband back to the site to enroll the family members. And then the end point with the number of family members who accomplished clinical screening 12 months after the proband was enrolled. And, uh, and then we returned molecular genetic results. This is back, you know, we started the study, or wrote the study back in 2014-15 before we had rapid return results. And so it was within a research program, so we allowed a year to return results. This is the study flow, I won't go through this, but it was just to say it was well balanced really came out very nicely, well balanced to uh, both uh, race and, and uh, <clears throat> between sites and stuff. And the end point again, we counted the number of first degree relatives who completed clinical screening within one year of proband enrollment. These are, this is the results. It was positive and I was amazed. I always said if this study's positive, I would be amazed and I, I was. Um, we had an odds ratio of 1.3 in favor of giving probands this booklet. And again, just to review, the clinical research coordinators would open the packet. It was either there or not there. If it was there, they handed it to the proband. That was it, nothing else, just giving them a booklet. So it was very easy, inexpensive. We also looked by race, and there was no suggestion that there's any difference between black and white, which we're very grateful for, and also Hispanics. And then we had a few, we sort of were doing this at the very, at the beginning of COVID and then we had to shut the study down and so there was a question of, of pre-COVID and, and really everything looked much the same whether the families came in pre-COVID or during the first part of COVID and, and which was also reassuring. So the family hard talk summary, despite the study's success, only 31% of FDRs actually enrolled and of course it was, the study was at no cost. Motivating FDRs has been the Achilles heel, not just of DCM and cardiovascular disease, but really the cancer literature is full of this too. Um, and we need much better insight to know how to motivate at-risk FDRs. Now, 
I mentioned we just submitted a study, uh, a grant to the NIH um, a week ago today uh, to take, to evaluate the family members going forward. We want to re-echo them and uh, we want to define a much earlier phenotype using echo strain and we want to add genetics to that. We actually want to inform the, the guidelines, which I've been helping write, which we, is most of it is expert opinion, which you know what that's worth. It's better than nothing, but <laughs> there's nothing like really rigorous data to actually write the guidelines, and we don't have it for genetics. I mean, we have it for everything else in cardiovascular medicine, not genetics. Uh, and then finally, we added a third aim, again, a behavioral aim, to try to understand what motivates families and family members to come in for screening. It's, it's just really important. If we know the genetics, we can prevent disease, but people are not availing themselves of it. We're not doing any good. Okay. Now, for those of you who may have come in late, I told the story of David Newell, a 14-year-old who I found in the pediatric intensive care unit at the Oregon Health and Science University dying. And we had a remarkable crash listing for transplant, got a donor within 48 hours, got him transplanted, it's a success story. I showed you this pedigree of the bilineal inheritance. We found heart failure in his father at research screening, except the call from my associate at Minnesota was of on the mom side of the family, so we had bilineal inheritance. And just to say that the usual black and white approach for effective status is inadequate. It's sufficient for monogenic pedigrees when you have one variant that goes through the whole family, it's, it's okay. And there's some genetic conditions that are like that. Dilated cardiomyopathy is not. So we need more phenotype de detail for oligogenic pedigrees. We came up with this idea and it's not novel. Uh, category four, advanced DCM, DCM related death. Three, symptomatic DCM, treatable and stable. Two, asymptomatic DCM. One, evidence of myocardial dysfunction, not meeting formal DCM criteria, and then zero, normal, nothing. This is the family. This is David at 14, critically ill with heart failure, emergent heart transplant. This is his next older brother. He developed heart failure in his 20s. He had a heart transplant at 31 years of age is alive and doing well. And then the oldest brother, fully asymptomatic, the most he's ever had is borderline left ventricular enlargement and some SVT off and on, which is treated with minimal intervention, some beta blocker and whatnot. His father, diagnosed with heart failure at age 44, died of heart failure at age 57, never won a transplant. Mom, never symptomatic, at most borderline LVE, um, and really no symptomatic arrhythmia is the way we would normally think of it. Her brother had asymptomatic DCM at research screening. He had sudden cardiac death at age 43 after we had diagnosed DCM in him. It was thankfully in church on a Sunday morning and he was resuscitated alive with an ICD and medically treated. And then the first cousin who brought the family to attention in our research study who had the sudden cardiac death at 17 years of age, but um, had DCM, met full DCM criteria then, but was fully responsive to treatment, alive and well, and, and really doing well. So we did exome sequencing, and on the maternal side, we found an FLNC nonsense, or a truncating variant identified. And that um, <clears throat> FLNC, of course, is an actin cross-linking protein, and it has prominent ventricular arrhythmias, sudden cardiac death, but relatively less uh, uh, LV dilatation, systolic dysfunction, uh, which kind of fits quite well with this family. And we uh, think that the uh, FLNC um, is causative for the maternal side of the pedigree. There's complete segregation. Uh, everybody who's affected has it. Uh, the protein, of course, it's a truncating uh, FLNC variant, which goes along with DCM, a rhythm representation, minimal DCM, and then no other candidates were identified in the maternal side. What else did we find? Well, we found a tight and truncating variant on the paternal side. And David, his next older brother, and oldest brother, and dad all had this. Titan, of course, I've already commented on, 10 to 20 percent of DCM. And, um, but in this pedigree, we think the tight truncating variant is unlikely to be causal because of lack of DCM in the sibling. So um, you can see here that, that uh, this older brother really had nothing, and so we, don't, we know that that tight variant is not the big thing. 
where, when it can be in, in, not uncommonly in families. What else did we find? We found a SOS1 variant, and uh, this was found in Dad, um, next older brother, and in David. Now, what's SOS1? Normally associated with Noonan syndrome, which is generally hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and um, if you find a variant in Noonan, it's usually PT, PTPN11 or KRAS. If those are negative, 20% will have SOS1. This is a encoseras, a guanine-nucleotide exchange factor, and in this pedigree, that variant was essentially not found in the uh, databases, and so we thought was highly relevant. And then um, Jason Cowan, who is now an assistant professor in the, in the Division of Human Genetics, uh, did some really nice uh, functional studies to show that that was uh, the real deal. So we proposed the SOS1 variant explains why the oldest brother had minimal disease. He only had the Titan variant. The lack of FLNC variant explains the later onset of more benign DCM in David's father. He really had only the SOS1. Maybe the Titan contributed a bit. The FLNC Titan SOS1 explains the greater disease of David and his next older brother, okay? The question is, why did David have a much more malignant course than his next older brother? We found a CAM kinase 2 delta variant that we think is protective. And CAM kinase 2D is extensive literature on this protein. It's part of the serine 3 and protein kinase family. It's a calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase subfamily. It interacts with phospholamba and, of course, a key calcium signaling protein in the heart. Um, and it's also been used to dissect RBM20 induced uh, splicing of key cardiac proteins. RBM20 is another key uh, DCM gene and is involved in genetic uh, cardiomyopathy. And then, most importantly, decreased CAM kinase 2 delta in models, animal models. And there's abundant literature of this. In fact, there's recent papers, I should have put the citations down, um, in the last even few months uh, that are, show that if you disable CAM kinase 2 delta, it is protective for progression to heart failure. So it's plausible. So we hypothesize the CAM2 uh, delta variant is protective, helped dad live as 57. So he had the SOS1 and a theoretically protective variant. David's next older brother had the protective variant, who so had later onset. David did not have the protective variant, so he had earlier on more malignant disease. And David's older brother, oldest brother, didn't need it. He didn't really have much risk. He only had the Titan truncating variant, which we think is a minor risk allele. So we don't have laboratory-based data yet on the CAM kinase 2 delta variant. We're working on it. Um, hopefully, in a few years, we'll get that figured out. Just to say that we always think of variants as being nasty, pathogenic, but they can also be protective. And it's actually a much harder thing to figure out, but in this case, it may actually, it, 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 it's illustrative at least of, of the complexity of DCM genetics. So DCM is not simple Mendelian any longer. By simple Mendelian, I mean one variant that explains all of the disease in an extended family. I didn't comment on this, but it's in the, in the genetics paper, the JAMA paper a couple months ago. 23% of our probands had more than one path likely path or VUS variant. That paper's not written yet. We need to get that done. Uh, it's complex. We need to understand DCM complexity. It's gonna take even a much larger study, and that study is on the drawing board to get from 1,200 to really 10,000, and we hope to get there in my career, hopefully, in the next few years, assuming we can get funding and all of that. Creating and testing key hypotheses for DCM genetics for complexity will continue to be essential, and so can we prevent heart failure? Yes, we can in first degree relatives of patients with DCM by clinical screening, repeated periodically as indicated, and then informed by genetic screening also as indicated. So I'd like to thank the DCM Precision Medicine Study investigators. This is a picture of um, a photograph taken of the July 2023 Summer Scientific Symposium. We bring in the site PIs. There were uh, 18 sites represented, 25 faculty. Um, and um, just to thank everyone, and yes, there's Cindy Martin uh, hiding there uh, back in the second or third row, but uh, Cindy came, which we're very uh, pleased about. 
and others, of course, on Zoom. Uh, this is the site, principal investigators and their institutions, just to recognize them. This is the first uh, panel, and this is the second panel. Really a wonderful group of, of uh, thoughtful uh, collaborators. Um, recognize Dan Kinneman, Elizabeth Jordan, Han Yu Ni, who are the first authors of this, those papers that I showed, uh, who are uh, really very talented and need to be congratulated, and then uh, other collaborators, and then our clinical research team, our informatics and computational team, and our administrative financial team. So, I would love to thank the, uh, you all for the opportunity to present, and uh, I've left a few minutes left for questions, and I'd be pleased to address any questions or comments you might have. And again, thank you to Cindy and Houston Methodist for the invitation. So. Dr. Harshberger, uh, fantastic talk. This is Ash here. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> So, you know, in, in, in patients who, uh, um, especially the first degree relatives who have the, um, the mutation uh, for preventing heart failure, one of the things which comes up is, you know, alcohol use. You know, what do, yeah. you, <laughs> what, uh, what do you recommend? Second question is, um, you know, we do see a lot of patients with um, what we would call as maybe non-ischemic cardiomyopathy really out of proportion to the degree of coronary artery disease yeah. that they've had. Uh, do you recommend testing in them? Yeah, it's two great questions. So the alcohol question has been one that we've all thought about, and we all have seen patients where drinking heavily, you get them to stop drinking, and guess what? They get better. And I have patients in my experience too, and actually then the patients restart drinking, and then they get worse, and then you get them to stop again, and it gets better. So I mean, it's, there's no question that alcohol and heavy use can facilitate DCM. We actually have an ongoing analysis. In fact, Saturday I promised my team I would go through the alcohol-related DCM paper. We have a major paper under to look at the association of genetics and alcohol. It turns out, I actually, I shouldn't say this because it's not published yet, but, uh, but there, we're, we're going to find some unexpected findings where <laughs> only at very heavy doses there's any suggestion at all, there's, any, there's no interaction. We can find no interaction, which goes against all the literature. And again, it's not published, but Han Yuni, who is a card-carrying, really sophisticated cardiovascular epidemiologist, has done this analysis, and if Han Yu does it, it's, it's probably bulletproof, so we'll see. The uh, second question was, or comment was, on uh, ischemic heart disease and the association of, de of, of genetics. And matter of fact, I was at the Heart Failure Society having dinner with a couple of site PIs, um, it, their request, not mine, and uh, we were talking. And this question was brought up by one of my colleagues. And he had delved into this. And he has some interesting findings, and we have delved into it too. We have some interesting findings. Uh, this is not published, and I, there was only one study which was done in a big pharma study, you know, where somebody had sequenced, done exome sequencing in a bunch of patients in, an, in a, um, it was several thousand patients, mostly all ischemics, to see what they could find. They didn't find much. I'm not sure the rigor of that study, and I would say the answer is unknown. Um, I have had that hypothesis, much as well as not only alcohol, but peripartum cardiomyopathy and ischemic. How much does rare variant cause, as I have shown, contribute to those phenotypes? I think the, the rigorous academic answer is we don't really know, number one. And then number two, we should probably look, assuming we can develop rigorous studies, so at the end of the day we will actually have a clue what we found when we find it. So. Thank you very much for, for coming and for sharing such a, uh, an exciting topic, complex. Thank you for your leadership in, in this field, really, it's amazing. A question to you regarding prognosis of such individuals. Yeah. You know, you've shared with us so many different yeah. variations of mutations. And can we classify, yeah. even on your patient that you showed us, some of them are protective, some of them yeah. are yeah. much more malignant. Should we, for the, for the clinician also, classify some of these variations or mutations as to quite lethal, yeah. rather benign, et cetera? So that's one part of the question. The other one is, 
can we detect some of that phenotype with imaging? Like yeah. cardiac MRI, yeah. does the yeah. FNLC yeah. Uh, show something scarring that's unusual? How about strain, tissue doppler, yeah. other things that we can help the clinicians yeah. with that? Thank you for the question. So I'll do this, the imaging second. We do actually, in this study, we were very privileged to have two ancillary studies. One, to get the echo digital data back, and now we're, and that analysis is almost completed for strain of the first degree family members. Very, very interesting. And the second imaging study was a cardiac MRI, CMR study, of the family members whose proband had a path likely path of VUS, and we have now 223 or so enrolled. The anticipated goal is 600. It's a tough study to get done. Fascinating findings of very early evidence of DCM, not only with LGE, late gadolinium enhancement, but also strain is, is being done in the CMR study. So we're really trying to define a very early phenotype of systolic dysfunction or other features to define this. So we could theoretically come up with a phenotype that would be rigorous, reproducible, and then we could dial in some treatment, could be ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, could be generic medical treatment or even gene therapy if it ever gets here, to prevent the progression even to full-blown DCN. And the first part of your question was? Was uh, classifications regarding Yes, prognosis. yes, prognosis. So again, our study is cross-sectional. We don't have longitudinal data. That's a limitation. Um, we think that the, really the way to figure this out is again, focus on the family members who are very early in disease so we can judge the progression and evolution of DCM with their genetics. And so uh, the grant we just sent out was really focused all on the family members to give us insight. The problem with doing, when, some, when the horse is out of the barn, late phase disease, I'm a transplant cardiologist, by the time they come in and see us, there have been so many other things that happen. They have so much other comorbidities, diabetes and hypertension, and of course the drugs and VADs and all of that. It's hard to figure out the natural history when you have a genetic condition way back that's been triggering all of this. So we need to roll back the, the time frame to earlier, and we think the, FD, the family members are the way to do that. You showed us the case of, you know, younger uh, two boys who are affected, have yes. a transplant, and of course the family that is affected. Uh, first question is, uh, counseling to them in their life yeah. as they yeah. go through childbearing yeah. and all yeah. that. Yeah. The next question I have is, when we do, uh, when we go through these with our patients and genetic counseling, uh, United States laws, don't necessarily prevent discrimination against genetic for, for chronic and, you know, lifetime insurances or disability insurances. Right. How do we convince these yeah. younger folks that their children need to be screened? Yeah. So the, yeah, Gina, the Genetic Information on Discrimination Amendment, you know, whenever it was over 10 years ago now, does protect for health insurance but not for life insurance, as you know. And so these are solutions to say buy life insurance before you get tested number one, or get your testing within a research study, that would be us, um, to, uh, because we will lock up the data and we only release it with written you know, uh, consent of, of the patient or the, or the family. Uh, but it's a problem and that needs to be addressed. But, and again, counseling is important for people to understand that. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, in terms of counseling, th this family that I showed, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, at least within our research study, we have always done is give back everything that we can uh, in the early days before genetics, in the 1990s and early 2000s, um, we would only give clinical data back, which is extremely important. Any evidence of clinical evidence of DCM would always give back, and then with genetics, we always give that back to within the context of counseling, so it's very important. I didn't really focus on that today, but, but it's, it's essential. I agree completely with you. So. What do we know and what is the research heading in terms of uh, understanding gene by environment interactions? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you've shown really nicely that there is race specific things and you know, by the environment yeah. it could be built, yeah. natural environment, yeah. but also the yeah. social environment yeah. and the socioeconomic status. Yeah, it's, it's, 
Thank you for asking that question. The question, again, if you didn't hear, is what about how do we figure out environmental impact? And um, we don't do a very good job of it, first of all. Second of all, other than the usual medical things like hypertension or diabetes or renal disease, uh, anything else, one thing that's very important to me is activity, exercise. Very hard to evaluate. In fact, I asked Hanyu Ni, my genetic, um, I mean my um, epidemiologist, to, is there a measure of sort of lifetime exercise exposure? It's, it's really, very, it's, there isn't a good measure for this. So uh, we need to do that uh, the best we can. Um, and, um, and the other part of your, first part of your question was? Yeah, so, um, and then the social determinants of health. In the, in the 2022 JAMA paper, we have this disconnect between white and black in terms of risk of familial disease. What is that? Is that social determinants of health or is that genetics? I didn't, I didn't have time to put in, uh, we just published a paper in circulation just, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Uh, it was, we divided our cohort into those that had VAD transplants, so advanced disease, those who had ICD only, and those who had none of those. Three different groups. And we looked at the genetics, and the genetics for those who had VAD or transplant was almost a two and a half fold increased chance of finding a path or likely path variant. Now, uh, we have another junior, very talented um, site principal investigator who is an, taking on the social determinants of health in a formal way. And that analysis is undergoing, is being done right now. To lay over social determinants of health on top of these different risk profiles. To see how much uh, social determinants of health actually influence these risk profiles to try to get at this. Very difficult to do, extremely important to do, to, dis to dissociate genetics from race and also environment and again what we would generally lump together as, as social determinants of health. Um, that's, a bit, we're, that's what we're going to try to do and hopefully that will be helpful, useful. But it's extremely important and we, it, it's, we're aware of it. That's all I can, we'll do the best we can. Any last question? Okay, so thank you very much for coming. And I really want to congratulate you on your leadership in this. This is tremendous work. You know, one of the things that it, you know, from your talk, it really brings out is the fact that you're talking about a multifactorial, uh, you know, issue. It's almost like you're playing 4D chess. And I want to actually add one more dimension to it, which is, do, are, do you have any data or are you aware of any data that when it comes to now first diagnosis and the next treatment of these patients, is there some genetic basis to responsiveness of, to treatment based on some of the different therapies that we have? Clarify the question for me. Does the genetic diagnosis inform treatment? Correct. Yeah. The, in my view, um, it does for a few genes. If you have a lamin variant, I didn't normally, I mentioned lamin, I didn't mention lamin today, LMNA, you know, it's, you know, arrhythmias and conduction system disease, then followed by DCM. If you have a lamin variant, it's trouble. Lots of fibrosis and lots of arrhythmias, and um, <clears throat> there's a fair amount of data in the literature to suggest the Lambent variant is, is trouble. Beyond that, in a systematic way across all of the genetic landscape, it's been sort of what I would call hodgepodge. You know, a single center study here, single center, maybe a group, you know, putting together their, their, their pathogenic variants. In terms of what I would call a rigorous study done well, we don't have it. We need it. Um, so the more arrhythmogenic genes, ARVC would be the, the category, we probably have more data to, to actually know that we need to put, instead of putting in a pacemaker, we need to put in an ICD. That would be the Lamin, you know, case. Um, in terms of really predicting long-term outcomes, I don't think we really have the data. And it turns out that natural history studies are the hardest to do. And I would refer to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy literature. I mean, there have been hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers, we all know these. They've been you know, collecting patients for 30 years. And this would be, and there's consortia that have published these data. Even within those, it's sometimes hard to really 
tease out you know, gene-specific longitudinal outcomes. So it's not a very good answer, but it's the best I can do. So. I want to say thanks again uh, for Dr. Hershberger for joining us, um, for kind of, again, helping open our eyes to some of the things that we may need to be looking for more because, as you said, we will definitely not find them if we don't look for them. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a little bit of a plug. We kind of talked about stuff about looking at imaging and cardiomyopathy. We have an upcoming grand rounds of Dr. Chathan Chenoy from the University of Minnesota oh, wow. is going to be talking about ways to diagnose different types of heart filler for imaging. So a wonderful segue. So those of you who are interested, be watching for that one. Otherwise, you guys have a great day and uh, next good weekend. Thank you.